I've got 12 o'clock on the dot. Um, hi, I want to introduce myself. I'm Leslie with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. I also have Anna Lena here with me that's also with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Uh, Larry has told me, if you guys have any questions, just type it into the Q&A. He's going to be answering the questions. He's been really good at keeping up with them and looking and uh, so if you see a slide and you have a question, just go ahead and type it in. If you have any problems with the Q&A, just raise your hand and we'll get to you and allow you to talk. So uh, Larry Donahue is um, uh, an attorney with over, and it was before it was 25 years, but I had, he's been there for 27, 28 years. So he's got a lot of information. Today, we're going to talk about operating agreements. What are they? Which, Larry, I want to know, what are they and why are they so important? So I'm going to turn it over to Larry Donahue um, and enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate it. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to remind everybody, please mute your audio, set your Zoom ratio to fit window. We'll give you the best perspective. Uh, there's a couple of minor animations in my presentation, so that'll help them uh, align up properly. Uh, and I want to encourage everybody to use the Q&A function, ask questions. Um, that helps me know that I'm not putting everybody to sleep on some of this stuff, and uh, also make sure that we're giving you some relevant information and material. Um, what we're going to be talking about is operating agreements and why are they so important. And in order to really answer the question, why are they important? I think you need to understand what they are, how they relate to things. And so uh, we're gonna discuss a lot of different aspects of really limited liability companies and partnerships and how all of that fits together. So uh, before I begin though, I wanted to remind you that the uh, SBDC has a lot of great um, sessions, webinars coming up and I'd encourage you to go to the website and up in the upper right hand side, they have a workshops uh, menu and you can see all the excellent stuff that they have coming up over you know, this week and, um, and onward. And I wanna just do a, a self promotion here on March 8th, one of my associate lawyers, he's a very good tax lawyer, is gonna be um, hosting uh, part one of business succession planning and buy sell agreements. And I believe he's gonna be um, hosting with a, uh, uh, a financial uh, consultant or representative from New York Life. And so I think that's gonna be a really good presentation. So with, um, with all of that, what are we gonna be discussing? Well, it's operating agreements, but from a couple of different pieces here. You know, First is you need to understand what a limited liability company is. And I think everybody here probably has heard about it and has a general understanding but uh, I wanna talk about some very specific points and it's gonna to relate to liability protection and, and protecting yourself as a business owner. And then um, I'll dive into some of the various aspects of the operating agreement and how it can protect you in different circumstances and scenarios. And then of course, Q and A. Uh, I generally like to talk a lot, even though I try not to. And so I haven't been giving people a lot of time on the Q and A at the end of these things. I'll try and do a little bit more for this one. Um, but at the same time, please ask your questions as we go through this uh, presentation. So to begin with, you know, what is an LLC? Well, an LLC is an acronym for limited liability company. It's a type of corporate entity. And I always tell people there's three or four main benefits in doing business under a corporate entity than doing business as a sole proprietorship or partnership. And those four are listed on the left column here. Liability protection, survivability, which means if something were to happen to you or the other owners, the business doesn't just dissolve uh, or close immediately like a sole proprietorship or partnership might do. The other thing is, is there, are, there are some tax flexibility and savings uh, with a corporate entity and then uh, flexibility. Uh, overall. And what I mean by that is um, most business owners, I mean, you're go-getters, right? You're, you're burning the midnight oil, oil, you're working hard, you're pursuing a passion. And that generally means 
you may have more than one passion. And so how do you put a nice little, you know, boundary and bow around the passion that is a particular business? So LLCs or corporate entities in general allow you to say, this entity is going to be my consulting business. This other entity is going to be my publishing business or you know, uh, my baking business or my dog grooming business. You can isolate and segment your different businesses into very discrete units or chunks. And why is that important? Well, maybe John would like to do some consulting with you, uh, but doesn't want to have anything to do with the dog grooming business or vice versa. It allows you to kind of containerize your different sort of things that you want to do in life or in business. Um, LLCs in particular are inexpensive to set up, maintain, and close down. And I cannot emphasize that enough on the close down. Corporations are a pain in the butt. You gotta go and get a, a tax certificate before the New Mexico Secretary of State will close down a corporation. In the meantime, it's incurring fees and creating problems for you. In order to form an LLC, it's, it's pretty easy. You submit an articles of organization to the state of New Mexico and you pay the filing. That's really all you need to do. The Secretary of State does not provide an operating agreement, by the way. And now you can find a zillion of them uh, for free on the internet. But what I'm hoping is that after this presentation here, you will realize you can't just go and get any operating agreement off the internet. If you do, you need to read it and make sure it really applies to your business. Um, the other thing an LLC has to have or any corporate entity has to have is a registered agent. And if registered agent has no power over the company, all they do is accept legal notices and service of process. That's all they do. And every company has to have one. And people get confused by this, but let's say you're a New Mexico company so you form a New Mexico LLC. You're doing business in the state of New Mexico. So you have what's called a domestic LLC in the state of New Mexico. You have to have a registered agent. <coughs> it could be yourself, by the way, as long as you have an actual physical mailing address. So you can be your own registered agent for the LLC. Now, let's say you start doing business across the border to Texas. Is your New Mexico LLC valid in Texas? No. It's not, unless you do what's called a foreign file. So think of a foreign filing as just an alias. It's the same company. It's just now registered in the state of Texas. And guess what? You need a registered agent in the state of Texas for your foreign filing if you are doing business in the state of Texas. So let's talk about liability protection for a moment and why it's so important. What you need to understand is, is when you do business, you can generate all sorts of harms, things that are unintentional. So I've listed this stuff on the left here, and you really need to understand that. A company is going to have its own debts, if, if, I, um, if I spelled it correctly, I have debits there instead of debts, uh, liabilities and obligations of the company while it's operating. And that makes sense. It's going to get into debt. Uh, maybe there's a dispute with a customer saying that they didn't receive the service that they paid for. It wasn't up to the standard or quality they were expecting. So those are debts, liabilities, and obligations of the company as it normally operates. And by operating as an LLC versus a sole proprietor or, or partnership, that means those debts, liabilities, and obligations stay with the company as opposed to go to the owners. Uh, to the extent that you don't sign a personal guarantee or otherwise agree to personal liability. So you gotta remember that. But you can get into trouble even in instances that are not your fault or that you didn't authorize. And I listed here harms caused by your partners and harms caused by employees or contractors. Even if you tell an employee, do not do this something, whatever that something is, and the employee goes and does that something, you can certainly hold the employee responsible and fire the employee, but through the laws of agency, the harms are imputed 
to the company that that employee was working for. So whether you authorize that employee to do something or not, if they cause a harm, now the company is potentially liable for that. So you, you really have to think about that. If you have contractors up on ladders or painting or cutting down trees or driving vehicles, just think about the trouble those people can get themselves into. Uh, finally, there's a concept of what's called negligence per se. And what that means is, is the company is doing something either illegally or without permission, without the following the law. And an example of that would be doing something that you didn't have a proper permit for. And I see this a lot with small companies um, and, and they just, they don't know the requirements. Like uh, I've had catering companies serving food and guess what? You need to register that company, especially in the city of Albuquerque. I, I don't know how it is with other cities, but I assume it's very similar, but they wanna know, you know that you're, you're meeting their cleanliness and sanitary and, and other requirements to be able to serve food. And I've had issues where people got sick at a wedding and the caterer didn't have what they wanted. Uh, and so they hired a third party to serve the food for them. And it, the third party was a contractor and that contractor wasn't appropriately licensed, bonded and permitted. And so they, everything they did was imputed to my client, the, you know, the, the event planner, actually, I think if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. And so um, even though my client thought and was told that the vendor was properly licensed and permitted, the fact that they weren't then goes on them because of the laws of agency. So that's negligence per se. And what that means is you're negligent end of story, no discussion about it. You violated the law or you didn't get the appropriate permitting, you are guilty. So negligence, and that could all fall on the company. And you want it to fall on the company versus yourself or the other owners. However, there's a really important exception to this and it's called piercing the corporate veil. Um, you know, it's funny, I would say maybe 75% of the people I talk to have heard of that concept. But basically it's a legal doctrine that plaintiff's lawyers are gonna to use to try and sue the owners as well as the LLC. Now, why are they gonna to wanna to do that? Well, a lot of LLCs don't have a lot of value. You know, a lot of us have service-based companies, not a lot of assets. And so if they're gonna go and sue an LLC, you know, we can potentially just walk away from the LLC or declare bankruptcy for the LLC and walk away from some significant debts. So what you're gonna see is a plaintiff's lawyer, a plaintiff is the party suing. So they're the ones going after you or your business and you would be the defendant. So the plaintiff's attorney is gonna name the company as well as the owners. And so then as part of the chess game that is civil litigation, we lawyers would try and get the case dismissed as against the individuals. And we'd argue, you know, you didn't, you know, you didn't um, make a claim that was one of these bullets below as it relates to being able to pierce the corporate veil. But if they do make a proper claim, then we got to defend ourselves and basically say, look, no, there was no commingling. We were following corporate formalities or whatever it is they're alleging that would potentially allow them to pierce the corporate veil. And so these are really important. And so you need to understand just because you're doing business as an LLC doesn't automatically mean you have liability protection. You have to practice what you preach. And what I tell people is, is, is to think of it as having a child. You bring a child into the family and the child is the business. The, the, the child doesn't have the ability to sign contracts, that's you, but you want the child to be the party on a contract. You want the child to be paying payroll. You want the child to be the party working with and interacting with everybody, not you. When the company gets paid, it's like the child getting paid. So I would expect checks to be in the name of the company, not you individually. If you receive checks individually or you have the company pay your mortgage, 
that starts looking like commingling. And when you commingle, that's a great way to give a plaintiff's lawyer the ability to try and pierce the corporate veil. The alter ego theory is, is kind of like, what it, what it means is, is it's difficult to separate or understand where you or the owners begin and where the company ends and where that separation is. If you don't have a clear line of separation, it could look like alter ego and people could try and pierce the corporate veil. The other thing is engaging in wrongful or fraudulent con uh, conduct. And I'm gonna say something here that is gonna be ridiculous just to prove a point. Suppose you had an LLC and you were going to have, you know, a cocaine cartel under it. You just intuitively know, right? The LLC is not going to protect you from criminal prosecution in a cocaine cartel, right? We're all on board with that. So I'm going to change the facts slightly and it's going to make you say, huh, well, instead of a cocaine cartel, let's call it uh, marijuana, medicinal medical use of marijuana. Now, will an LLC protect you? Well, maybe from the state, if the state has the right laws, but not from the feds. You know, that's the real danger that um, we've had with this whole medical marijuana and the recreational use of marijuana. The feds aren't on board with all of this. You know, fortunately, it doesn't look like the feds are doing anything about it, but oh boy, they certainly could have done something about it. So at uh, any rate, an LLC is not going to protect you from those sorts of activities. And you got to you understand where, you know, sort of an LLC, LLC fits. It has to be its own thing. And you have to do billing and pay expenses through it, not you. So it adds a little bit of more work uh, on the financial and accounting side. But the dividends, it, it really helps, especially with the liability side. So what does this have to do with operating agreements? Well, an LLC is defined by the articles submitted to the state of New Mexico and the operating agreement. It's basically a contract. It's a contract between the owners. And I will admit, if you're the only owner, it seems kind of ridiculous, right? Like, well, why do you have a contract with yourself? The answer is, if you don't have an operating agreement, how do you manage the LLC? How do you? You don't know. Well, the answer is you're supposed to look to statute. So I don't know how many here are familiar with the New Mexico Limited Liability Company Act and can run their company accordingly. But I'll tell you, I've read the whole thing, you know, from start to finish, probably over 100 times, and I cannot remember everything in it. And it's not always intuitive because it's not the way you run or run your business. So an operating agreement allows you to override in certain instances, what New Mexico law is as it relates to how you'd manage an LLC. So you want an operating agreement even for a sole member LLC, but with a partnership or more than one owner, <coughs> excuse me, it's really important. So it's a contract and hopefully you're gonna read it and deal with it once and then not have to deal with it anymore. But when, um, when there's problems, it's going to be there like any other contract and it's going to be able to hopefully guide you through the potential problem. So I listed a bunch of these here where you see where the operating agreement can help. Definitely with partnership disputes, you know, your your operating agreement is going to be really important in a partnership dispute as well as a lawsuit whether it's against the LLC or whether the LLC uh, the plaintiff is trying to go after the members as well. The other reason you're going to need an operating agreement is for tax audits and then, of course, anything to do with finances or financial issues. Banks, the SBA, for instance, the PPP loan. Uh, there were a lot of people scrambling to get an operating agreement because they were trying to be eligible for the PPP loan. Um, now, what I want you to understand is, is that if you don't have the operating agreement, you have to look at state law. And hopefully you don't want to do that and you'll get an operating agreement the um, operating agreement will identify what the quote unquote corporate formalities are. And that's important for piercing the corporate veil. So what is a corporate formality? Well, do you need to call a vote if you wanna borrow a certain amount of money? The answer is yes, you do. 
and what are those thresholds? I don't. I bet you nobody knows, um, or it's very rare that people will know what the state law says. So you can have a threshold in your operating agreement. Uh, do you need to call a vote to get a bank account? To you know, get certain types of uh, financing or selling assets or you know, incurring certain liabilities. All of that would be corporate formalities, and you want to follow those, whatever those are in the operating agreement. And usually it's just calling a vote and then documenting that vote and throwing it into a three ring binder and hopefully never needing to go back to it. But if you do, you have it there and it'll help protect you. So the other issue is the IRS. The, I think everybody's probably heard of the word distribution and a company can give you a distribution. But I bet most people don't realize the word distribution only applies in very limited tax circumstances. And I'm going to go into much more detail here in a few minutes on the tax side. But the operating agreement has to follow what you're telling the IRS. And if it doesn't, and if you get audited, you're going to get yourself in a world of trouble. And when I say a world of trouble, I'm not saying you're not going to get arrested, that, you know, it's not a crime, but it would be a violation of the IRS rules. And the IRS is just going to say, well, we're going to, they will usually assume the worst, which means you're going to end up paying a lot of money in back taxes and penalties and interest because you weren't properly computing um, your taxes. Um, the other issue with operating agreements that's important is it deals with catastrophic events, edge cases, you know, death, incapacity, divorce, bankruptcy, and more. And we'll go into a little bit of detail on some of this in a minute. But let's talk about partnership disputes. And I don't know if anybody here participated in my top uh, 10 um, business mistakes that, that business leaders make, but partnership disputes was one of them. And it's very common. And, and I got to tell you, you know, I've been practicing law 27 years. My law firm is about a $3 million business right now. And a third of our revenue comes from this partnership disputes. It's almost like a bad divorce. And you'd just be surprised at the crazy stuff people find themselves in with their partners. They don't, they'll enter into a partnership you know, it, with very different requirements, then they'll enter into a marriage. And you really need to enter into a partnership like a marriage and really think about the other individual. And then you have to have a good operating agreement, which serves as a partnership agreement. And it will deal with these issues that I've listed here. You know, what happens if they die or become incapacitated? If they're, they're just a bad person stealing from the company or abusing or neglecting people. You know, I've had issues, all of these issues I've had as a lawyer, by the way, and they have never been easy to resolve. When I say, when you hear a lawyer say, not easy, think expensive, okay? So that's what put bread on my table is these difficult problems to solve. Um, but we've had other issues where it's not, you know, people are just, downright mean, but they just don't pull their own weight, you know, or they don't contribute the way they said, or maybe they want to leave the company. And then if you don't have a good document written on how do you deal with these kinds of problems, it opens yourself up for dispute, debate, difficult, hard to solve problems. And like I said, when a lawyer says difficult or hard, think expensive. So, you need to understand that under the law, there's very little to protect you from a bad partner. The only thing that's gonna protect you from a bad partner is an operating agreement. There's very little you can do in the face of bad behavior, even theft. I can't tell you how many times, you know, the, um, one of the partners calls the police, hey, my partner's been stealing, the police show up. And you know what the police say? if they have half a brain in their head, and that's usually about 95% of the time, sorry, we can't get involved, this is a civil matter. The other 5% of the time, they don't have a brain in their head, and so they just make some sort of random decision. Somebody's gonna go downtown and they randomly decide to arrest somebody. And of course, nothing goes anywhere because this is a civil matter, it's not a criminal matter. Even with embezzlement, that is a criminal matter. 
but it's very difficult to prove and prosecute. And guess what? You as a partner, me as a lawyer, we don't prosecute crimes. I'm not a criminal prosecutor. Do you know who is? The state of New Mexico. So that means the attorney general or a district attorney. And what does that mean? You got to get them to hope to prosecute your case, which isn't easy to do, especially if you don't have a lot of really good information. So an operating agreement is really going to create the right contract for you to deal with situations like that. Um, but I want to tell you, don't just walk away if you have a partnership problem. If you walk away, you're basically leaving the fox in the hen house and there's nothing you can do about it. He, you know, the, the partner can continue to incur debts and liabilities and you're not around there to protect yourself. And oh, now they're not filing taxes properly. You're still an owner of the company. You're potentially jointly and severally liable for the tax obligations of the company if you just walk away. So. An operating agreement here is really important for partnership disputes. It can enforce a dispute resolution process. It can define unacceptable behaviors. You know, do you need to work full time for the company or not? Do you, you know, can you compete with the company or not? Do you need to contribute capital if the company needs money or not? Can you be removed under certain circumstances or can your partner, can you voluntarily leave? If you voluntarily leave or you're removed, what does that look like? Do you get paid for your percentage ownership of the company? And if so, how much? All of that stuff would be in a good operating agreement. So there's other partnership issues though, even if you're getting along with your partner just fine. Uh, I call them life speed bumps, you know, I, I brought up death or incapacity, but just think about that for a moment. What happens, heaven forbid, if your partner dies? Do you just take ownership of, of your partner's membership interest or ownership interest? Or does their ownership interest go into their estate and then you are now a partner with their beneficiaries. And how does that look? And if you do take the company or can you take the company in a death or incapacitation, what is the company worth? And how do you pay? And do you have the ability to just cough up all the money at once? Or maybe do you need some uh, payment terms spread out over time? And I'll tell you, for instance, my law firm, I told you we're doing about you know $3 million in business. Let's assume that the value of our law firm was one times revenue. So that means the firm would be worth $3 million. I own 50% of that, so does my partner. If he died, I don't have $1.5 million sitting around to pay his estate. So we've put in our operating agreement that I have the option, not the duty, the option to purchase his ownership interest if he dies from his family, so his family will not be my partner, I can buy it, and then I can pay over time, up to 92 months. And the reason it seems like a long time is the firm just may not have the cash flow to be able to pay something and I don't wanna breach uh, a note or a promissory note that I owe to his family if something were to happen to him and vice versa. The other issue is uh, from, you know, I'm a lawyer, so we care a lot about our licenses. But I'm not unique in that, right? There's doctors and dentists and CPAs and you know uh, engineering firms. The list is on contractors where you care about licensing. So what happens if a partner loses a license? How do, what does that mean to your business and their ownership? Do you care or not? What happens if somebody becomes bankrupt? Maybe the company's doing great, but they themselves become bankrupt. Is that gonna be a problem for the business? And what would you do about it? And what about incarceration? You know, you need to think about these issues and do you kick them out? Do you keep the business going? And then they can come back at a later date when they get these problems resolved? You know, you need to think about those issues. And then if they're staying around, do they continue to get paid? Are they entitled to distributions or profit sharing? You need to think about all of that. There's other issues. You know, what happens if a partner gets divorced? Now, typically that wouldn't matter so much, but 
you know, in a state like New Mexico, you have the issue of the partner, or excuse me, the spouse of the partner claiming that the partner's percentage ownership in the company is a marital asset subject to being shared or split. And I got to tell you, I, uh, you know, I, I consider myself like a, almost like a rock star minus the uh, fame, good looks and um, wealth because I've had the, uh, the, the lovely experience of having several divorces and dealing with divorce court here in New Mexico. And I get to tell you, it's like another universe. Logic, fairness go completely out the window and it, it almost seems like, you know, it's just who do they like or whose lawyer do they like? I know I'm sounding very bitter, but it's, it's just an insane asylum over there. So it's very difficult to predict what the divorce court, it's called domestic matters or DM court here in New Mexico. It's very hard to predict what they're going to do. So what you don't want to do is leave it up to the court to decide whatever they're going to do. You're not a party to the court your partner is. So if your partner goes and, you know, loses a percentage of his interest to the wife, you can have in the operating agreement that the company automatically buys the ownership interest of anybody other than the members. So if a court tries to force somebody in on your partnership, you can deal with that by forcing a buyout. So that could help you in many instances, unless you don't care and you're okay doing business with the, uh, your partner's ex-spouse. Uh, I got to tell you though, you're going to be a glutton for punishment because it's very rare that the ex-spouses are going to get along. And so you're going to have two partners that practically hate each other. And it's going to be a difficult situation in almost any business context. Um, but there's other issues. You know, what happens if your um, partner tries to sell his ownership in interest or her ownership interest. You need to be able to, you know, maybe you're okay with that. Maybe not. You can either do things like prevent the sale entirely. You're, you know, you're stuck. You can't sell at all. Or you can give yourself what's called a right of first refusal. So if you're going to go and sell your ownership interest and you find a willing buyer at a certain price, then you got to take that uh, package and offer it to your partner so that your partner can step in and purchase the ownership interest from you versus you selling it to a third party. That's called the right of first refusal. And I would strongly recommend that in almost all instances. Uh, and guess what? I don't believe that's in the statute. So some of these things I'm mentioning here aren't in the New Mexico statute at all. So if you did not have an operating agreement, you wouldn't have those benefits. Finally, you know, what happens if a partner just wants to leave? You know, what does leaving even mean? You know, if they stop coming in, I would argue you've, you, you left. Yeah, no, you didn't go to another state or another city, you know, in another country, but you left. You, you're not showing up. So you voluntarily left your position in the company. And oh, look at this. The operating agreement says this is what your payout is. So that's very important, depending on the type of partner you have. So let's talk about tax issues for a moment. Even if you have a sole member LLC and you have no partners, or you have a partner who's a family member or best friend that you trust forever and you don't believe you're gonna have any family or, or disputes, you care about the tax issues. And so I'm gonna give you a little tax overview here and apologies to the CPAs, accountants and tax lawyers if I have any here because I am not one of those. So I know just enough to get myself in trouble. And then I bring in my associate Ian Alden who is a tax lawyer to get me out of trouble or move, push, push our clients in the right direction. But for LLCs, you need to understand that it's a very flexible uh, entity type. And it, the IRS permits you to create what's called a tax status for the LLC. And I've listed the four ways here that a LLC can be taxed. So it's, it's, it's almost voluntary in that you can pick what's best for you and your business to minimize your tax. And what I've listed here is disregarded partnership S Corp C Corp. Disregarded is, it's like the LLC doesn't exist at all. 
for tax purposes. So its profits and losses flow through to you directly. Partnership in S Corp, uh, well, partnership assumes you have more than one member and a, you would treat your company like a partnership. S Corp and C Corp, you're used to those with corporations. Corporations usually have either one of those designations. And what's interesting is the top three here, disregarded partnership and S Corp are what's called pass-through taxation. The profits and losses flow through to the owners. The company itself is not paying a tax. And that's versus the C Corp. It's not a pass-through, it pays its own taxes. And if you ever heard of like, well, what's the corporate tax rate? That's what we're talking about there. C Corps are taxed at the corporate rate. And it's important to understand all these issues because they're very different, each one of these. And your operating agreement has to reflect your tax status of the company. And why this is important is a lot of people think, well, I, I need to worry about an operating agreement when I first form my company and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's not true. The reason it's not true is when you form your company and then you get an FEIN, a federal employee identification number from the IRS, the IRS is going to default you depending on a few things. One, the number of members that you have. And if you have one member, or if you're a husband and wife ownership, two members in a community property state like New Mexico, the IRS is going to default you to disregard it. If you have three or more members or two or more members that uh, could be husband and wife in a non-community property state, they'll default you to partnership. They're not going to default you to S Corp or C Corp at all. So if that is the wrong default, you're going to have to submit a entity tax change document to the IRS to get the appropriate tax designation you want. So you formed your company, you have an FEIN, and then you have the appropriate tax designation. You're great. Now you start doing business, you start making money, and then a year or two comes around and your CPA says, I think, <coughs> excuse me, you need to be an S Corp or a partnership. Your CPA makes a recommendation because they think you can save some tax dollars by having a different tax status. That's great, by the way. That's exactly what you want to hear from your CPA or accountant. But you can't just go and change the entity type. You got to go look at your operating agreement and see what its default tax status is. And you may need to change the operating agreement to support the new tax status. And I'll explain why in a minute. But let's go, let's do a quick overview of what these mean. Disregard it. The company's profits and losses flow through to your Schedule C. It's almost like you have a paper route. The company is not paying taxes at all. It's not even submitting a tax filing. It's not doing anything. All that money just flows right through to your personal bank account, and that's okay. Although I would recommend, remember, we want the alter ego. We don't want to have people to, or a plaintiff's lawyer to argue, wait a minute, the, you know, he's commingling funds. So it would be good to have your own bank account for the company and it pays bills and it receives revenue from that bank account, but you can then take money out of that for yourself and pay yourself however you want with that bank account that is owned by the company. A partnership is, remember, a pass-through entity it pays its members through distributions, profits. If there's a profit, you can get paid. That money will be reported on a K-1 that the company issues to the owners. And so if you own 50% of a company, the K-1 will show that you have 50% ownership and it'll indicate what profits or losses flow through to you as it's reported on the K-1. An S Corp is different. And S Corp requires a couple of things. One is it requires, you have to pay, let me rephrase this, the active members, the active owners have to get paid a reasonable salary. And then it could also pay distributions out of profits, again, reported on a K-1. Now, an S Corp is really popular because of this. So what is a reasonable salary? 
well, I'm a lawyer and, you know, I don't know, let's, let's say a reasonable salary is $70,000. So I have to pay myself $70,000 is a reasonable salary. That is deductible by the company as an expense. When I get paid that money, I get a W-2. I have ordinary income for that $70,000. But let's say the firm, it makes enough money that it can actually pay me more than that $70,000. Let's say the company has enough money to pay me $100,000. Well, I pay W-2 income on the $70,000, but I pay a different tax rate on the distribution. And sometimes it's pretty significant, um, the, the, the difference between my tax rate for ordinary income versus a tax rate on a distribution. And I don't remember the exact number, unfortunately. I wanna say it's maybe 15 or 20%, something like that, versus the ordinary income rate, which is gonna be you know, in the 30s, um, you know, high 30s or low 40s. So S Corp is desired by most companies. C Corp is different. It pays you W-2 wages, and then if there's any profits, it issues a dividend, not a distribution. And double taxation is very possible with this. And why is that? Well, when the company has profits, the company pays taxes on those profits at the corporate rate because it is a taxable entity. So if it made, I'm making up numbers, $100,000 in taxable profits, then it is, issues you a dividend so it pays taxes on the profits, issues you a dividend, where then you pay taxes on that dividend. So that's why you get double taxed with a C corporation. And that's why it's not a favored tax structure, except in very limited circumstances. But S corp is favored, but you need to know something. S corps have restrictions on ownership. And what does that mean? Well, <coughs> And I'm going to give you a list here what those restrictions are. But basically, you only can have an S Corp tax treatment if you fulfill the IRS's requirements. And if you don't fulfill the IRS's requirements, then what does the IRS say? Well, you did it wrong. We're going to assume you're a partnership. No. They say, you did it wrong. We're going to assume you're a C Corp. And if you were paying yourself in paying taxes and submitting all the forms as though you're an S-Corp and the IRS comes along and says, sorry, Charlie, you did not qualify for S-Corp tax treatment. You lose your status as of three years ago. So now you got three years of penalties and interest and different tax rates. It could kill your business. You never, ever, ever want that to happen. So what are the restrictions for an S-Corp? Well, there's the four here that are really important. One is only individuals can own an S Corp or an LLC if it's disregarded. Also only US citizens and residents, you can only have one class of stock and you can't have more than a hundred shareholders. So if any of those restrictions turn out to be false, you're not an S Corp anymore, you lose your election. So why do we care? Well, let's say your partner says, hey, I want to, I don't want to own the company directly. I want my LLC to own the company. Well, your answer needs to say, ah, I, is it a disregarded LLC? What's that is probably going to be the answer. And you're going to be like, no, your answer needs to be no. But if they do know what a disregarded entity is and they say it is and it won't change, well, what happens if it does? What happens if they get married and they give ownership to their, their spouse who's not living in a community property state? You know, what happens if they give some ownership to their kids or something? So you aren't in control in all circumstances on these restrictions is my point. And so that's where the operating agreement comes into play. So when you, you have your S Corp tax treatment, number one, that's defining the operating agreement. Then you wanna put limitations on the owners themselves so they don't screw up the tax status. And so that's a real key thing that a lot of people miss, unfortunately. And you need to think about what would 
automatically trigger or kick in if a member were to violate or inadvertently violate the rules. And so that's a real important piece of the operating agreement, not just from what your tax designation is, but if your tax des designation is S Corp, you want additional language in there to protect the company in case there were any issues relating to the restrictions. You know, what about a US citizen, you know, partner, and then they want to go and move to Europe? That could be a big problem for the S Corp tax designation. You need to think through those issues before you would approve a partner leaving or doing something like that. So there's other issues that are gonna go into an operating agreement that are really important and a lot of people don't fully realize. Um, one is the concentrations or distribution of power. So unanimous versus supermajority versus majority. Now, unanimous votes protect the minority. Right, so imagine you owning 1% of a company and your partner owns 99%. But if you require a unanimous vote, your vote counts as much as everybody else's. So unanimous voting allows minority owners to protect themselves from the will of the majority. However, when you require unanimous vote on anything, trying to get people to you know, agree to things can be very difficult. And so I find when companies require unanimous votes on fairly mundane things like borrowing and you know, hiring, it, the business doesn't go very far. You know, it, it just, it's, it, it, it's, it becomes like you know, the, the minority or the mediocrity is kind of the word I'm looking for here. It's just a mediocrity kind of, business. And so unanimous is not really recommended unless you do have this issue of, you know, majority owners that you're concerned about. Um, you know, majority vote is interesting because then, you know, a majority of the owners can help make decisions and the company is not going to be deadlocked so much. But if you have a majority owner, it's the majority owner's company in most instances. So probably the right answer is you would have majority vote for most things, but unanimous vote for certain key things like bringing on a new partner, uh, increasing or decreasing the percentage ownership interest of anybody, um, declaring bankruptcy, you know, really key high level decisions, maybe unanimous and everything else majority. Um, managers. You know, you do not have to have a manager, by the way. An LLC can be a member managed or manager managed company. The reason you would consider a manager managed company is if the members either aren't going to be directly involved in the day to day affairs of the company. So the members might want to designate a manager to focus on the day to day activities, or there's just, you know, a primary person who wants to be able to make decisions and you know, open up bank accounts without calling votes all the time. So then you might have a manager as well. But if you do have a manager, you want to define what powers he or she would or wouldn't have and how you might cycle out managers if a manager isn't working correctly. But all of that would go in the operating agreement. A capital call is a, you know, basically saying the company needs money. We need you to cough up money for the company. And think about that for a minute. You know, companies might need money and maybe member B doesn't have the money to produce in this capital call for some reason. What then? Does that member, you know, get a loan from the company somehow? Does that member lose some membership interest, you know, tied to the amount of money in the capital call? There's no right or wrong answer here, but you need to think through those issues. And so if you're going to have one partner and this has happened before, that is fairly well-to-do and rich, and the other partners are not, we've had instances where the, the well-to-do partner starts making capital calls knowing that the other partners cannot keep up and then use that to take more and more ownership away from the partners that couldn't do, you know, participate in the capital calls. So there's a lot of really interesting things you got to be aware of and be careful of in dealing with something like capital calls. Uh, the operating agreement also deal with how to distribute assets and liabilities during a wind down. 
The reason that's important is let's say you are an IP contributor. You have software or um, hardware or a trailer or something you've contributed to the company. Do you get that back if the company closes down? That would go in the operating agreement. And if you don't get it back, I assume you're going to get reimbursed for it maybe. You want that specified. Valuation is a really important thing here. And I want to explain the concept of book value versus fair market value. So fair market value is, you know, what is the market willing to pay for a business of your type, given its cash flows and liabilities and so on? Book value is different. It's pretty much assets minus liabilities. So in general, not always, but in general, a company is going to have a higher fair market value and a lower book value. Now, why do we care about that? Well, if you know we were going to um, sell the company and pay each other off, we're gonna get fair market value. If maybe I'm gonna voluntarily leave, I'll get fair market value. But let's say I'm stealing from the company or I lose my license or I do something um, that I shouldn't maybe I should get book value instead of fair market value. What you don't want is me getting nothing because then you are getting something for nothing and that can create some tax issues as well as I might be able to argue or try to invalidate the operating agreement at least as it relates to that particular piece. So you wanna pay me something and what you wanna do is pay me the least possible, especially when I'm a bad actor or I've done something wrong uh, or I, got divorced and my ex-wife forces her way into the company. Pay her book value versus fair market value to get her out of the company. So it's important to define those things and you could uh, help save yourself some money or you know do the right thing depending on the circumstance. Uh, and I'm gonna go through the others real quick but we're gonna move into Q&A. Um, operating agreement can also provide for different classes or levels of ownership. Uh, the biggest two levels you hear about a lot are voting versus economic non-voting interest, but not for an S-Corp. S-Corp, one of the IRS requirements are you cannot have different classes of ownership. So <clears throat> if you were being taxed as an S-Corp and your operating agreement had two classes of ownership, huge problem. You, you just right away, huge problem and you need to get that fixed. Uh, but other things, membership duties and restrictions. And there's a lot of issues here. You know, uh, employment. Do you got to devote your full-time energies to the company or not? Do you have to avoid or disclose conflicts of interest? Do you, you know, do you waive the duty of loyalty to the company? Do you get right of first refusal on transfers or sales opportunities? Do you get to participate in future funding, if you have a, a, a company where you're getting VC or angel or other types of funding, do you want to be able to participate in that to maintain or improve or increase the uh, percentage ownership interest you have? Um, there's financial requirements. You know, a lot of companies, they don't, you know, distributing profits and losses are optional, right? If a company ha makes a bunch of money, it doesn't have to pay the owners, does it? It could go and reinvest in the company. Do you wanna force the company to distribute profits? If you have a majority owner, and I've seen this happen, a majority owner will go and starve out the minority owners by not issuing distributions for a few years. Is that what you want or do you wanna protect yourself from that? And finally, voluntary withdrawal versus involuntary disassociation. Voluntary withdrawal basically says, hey, look, guys, I'm done. I want to leave. Buy me out. Do I have the right to do that or not? And if I do have the right, do I get fair market value, book value, or something else? Do I get a lump sum payment or payment over time? So it's important to figure that stuff out versus an in involuntary disassociation. Uh, it means involuntary. An example would be a death or incapacity, right? That was not voluntary. What do we do over that? But there's other types of involuntary disassociation. If I uh, declare bankruptcy, if I commit a crime, if I lose my license as a lawyer, for instance, can the firm disassociate itself from me? And the answer is you bet. 
um, under New Mexico law for lawyers, you can't have a non-lawyer owning a law firm. So the firm has to disassociate itself from me if I lose my bar license, for example. So those are all things you might want to see in an operating agreement. And, and this is why operating agreements are so important. So the other quick thing I'm going to just talk about is when to adopt a new operating agreement. And I have it listed here. If the LLC brings on a new member, if you change its status from member to manager, managed, or vice versa, if you change something fundamental with the way the company operates, or you change your tax status, you would have your first operating agreement is called operating agreement, but your second and third and so on operating agreement would be called first or second or third amended and restated operating agreement. I want to warn you, even though I'm saying it's important to adopt a new operating agreement when things change, it's also hard to do that because it usually requires a unanimous vote of the members. You'd want that, right? You wouldn't want the majority member just deciding to change the operating agreement on their whim. So you'd really want everybody to vote on that. And when you get everybody to vote, you know, it's sort of mediocrity rules the day. So it's sometimes very hard to change the operating agreement. But when you have big fundamental changes like this, as long as you're not changing other key clauses, it'll hopefully be easier. Finally, just mention about COVID. Big question here is, is your business essential or non-essential? And remember, COVID has taught us that pandemics can last a long time. You know, if we're gonna have an issue with a non-essential business, maybe we can get by in two weeks or a month, but what happens in a year's time frame? We may need to be a flexible, you know, allow people to work at other jobs to make, you know, feed their families. But when the company comes back, then what? You need to figure that out and have that documented. The other thing I want to suggest for everybody is think about key man or key life or uh, not key life. Yeah, key life or key person insurance. And what that does is we'll, we'll, it's, it's sort of like life insurance, term life insurance for all the owners. And it will give the company a cash injection if something happens to somebody, like they get sick, heaven forbid, and either die or become incapacitated because of COVID. And then um, finally, I'm seeing this a lot. You know, what happens if a partner won't or cannot help the company obtain PPP funds or deliver the right documentation or sign the right documents so you can get PPP funds or other SBA funding? So you want to think about what rights you or the company should have if a partner is not willing to step up and help in those instances. So we're finally to Q&A. I gave us a whopping three minutes I promised I was going to give us more for Q&A, but uh, we didn't get any uh, Q&A during the, the talk. But uh, I okay. open it up for questions if anybody has any. Yes, and it is open for questions. I do, my head is spinning, Larry. I just want to let you know because it is a lot Sorry. of information. Um, we are, and Anna Lena can help me with this, we are going to have it pre-recorded on demand on our website because I... I got some information and then I said, wait, I did I lose my place? Um, this is a, operating agreements are so important and there's a lot of information you have to put into them. So uh, I do suggest that uh, we have the pre-recorded on demand that everyone checks that out. And we do have one question, does an operating agreement need to be filed with any agency? Great question. That is a great question. The answer is no. The operating agreement is a private document between you and the other partners. The only time you have to cough it up is in those instances I talked about in one of the slides where you get audited by the IRS, sued and it becomes discoverable or uh, a bank or lending institution wants a copy of it for whatever reason. There's another quick question. It seems very important and very complicated, which is what I was trying to get across. It, <laughs> it is important and complicated. In a typical situation, how much time is needed to get one done? Ooh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I will say um, if, you know, there's a lot of providers on the internet that'll set up companies for you, you know, Rocket Lawyer, Legal Zoom, uh, Inc. File, a lot of, you know, they're, they're good companies with good names, but if they're going to give you a, a template and say, here you go, um, you really need to have a lawyer look at it, you know, and, and work with you to figure this out. We wrote an expert system. It's uh, not as good as a lawyer, 
but it's a heck of a lot better than the templates. There's a lot of a lot of maturity and movement around this to try and reduce the cost associated with getting a good operating agreement out there. But depending on which service you use, it could be a few minutes to uh, days or weeks negotiating with the other partners. Um, Should it be notarized? In, an operating agreement does not need to be notarized. No need to notarize it at all. Is selling online and shipping out of state considered as doing business out of state? So that is Polly, an outstanding question that probably should be the subject of another uh, webinar all by itself. The quick answer is, is if you're just simply shipping out of state, probably not. But if you're purposely availing yourself of another state, then yes. What does purposeful availment mean? Good question. Every state has its own definition around that. So it's just lovely from a business perspective. But the, the quick answer is, is if you uh, are getting 10% or more of your revenue from a particular state, then you're probably availing yourself of that state. If you have a W-2 employee in a state, you are definitely availing yourself of that uh, state. If you are devoting a significant amount of advertising or directly marketing into a state, then yes, you are purposely availing yourself of the state and you're gonna to have to register your company in that state. I believe Anna Lena has chatted over to all attendees the link to uh, watch uh, the, uh, the on demand of this uh, webinar today because again, I can't stress enough, it is complicated and important. And uh, I thank you if you have any last questions, if we can get them in real quick. Uh, we don't want to uh, take up too much of your time, but if you do have a question and uh, like Larry to answer it, let us know. And then um, we will be seeing Ian Alden on Monday next week for business succession plans, which sounds to me like it would kind of um, kind of tie in with what you're talking about today, Larry, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And Leslie, I just wanted to take a quick moment to explain what I chatted through to everyone. Uh, the first, the NMSBDC webinars as, at sfcc.edu is where you guys can direct any questions that you have. The next link is a link to our upcoming workshops and events that we have where the on-demand uh, recording of today's webinar will be as soon as I've put it up. I will also email that to you along with slides of the presentation. And then the very last link includes uh, the sign up page where you can sign up for counseling with an NMSB DC counselor should you want more detailed information or have any questions in regards to your business. Um, thank you again for, oh, it looks it, like we have one question yet. Go one, ahead, Leslie. One last question, and this is a great question to end on. When should an operating agreement be written before registering the LLC? or after. Larry, you want to wrap it up with that answer? Oh, my Lord. You know, that seems like such an easy question, but it's a really complicated answer. I'm going to say um, form the LLC first and get the operating agreement done is, is step number two. Awesome. Thank you so much for today. And uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, let us know if you need any more information. You guys have a great day. Yes, thank, thank you, you everyone. All. Take care.